We're going to go ahead and get started. I wanted to welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. I am your host, Dr. Lauren Levine. Uh, I wanted to welcome you all, and there's a lot of you here. We've got uh, right around 1,100 people that were registered. Um, I hope that you're all staying safe and, and healthy. That's obviously the most important thing. I uh, appreciate you all being here. I know that uh, times are not actually easy right now, uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, the need for ongoing education goes away. And uh, of course, you're all proven that by being here this evening. Uh, really, over, since March, I, I've just seen huge numbers for the webinars. And uh, obviously, the fact that we had 1,100 registered is, is proof of that. Um, I'm only going to speak for about a minute or two, just a little housekeeping. I want to make sure that we have time for question and answer at the end. Most of you have been on these webinars in the past. You kind of know the format. Our speaker, Dr. Kaczynski, is going to talk for 45 to 60 minutes or so. Um, but at the end, we always leave time for questions and answers. Uh, it's not going to be uh, verbal questions. You type in your questions. So on your screen, or maybe if you moved it off to the side, you have a little go to webinar control panel. Just type in your questions as you think about them. I don't normally interrupt the speaker until the end. Um, so uh, you know, just put them in as you think about them. I, I will tell you that based on past experience, we never get to all the questions. We'll do our, we'll do our best. Um, I will be able to see all the questions. I can combine a few together so that we can try to get to as many as possible. If I don't get to your questions, I apologize about that, but we do have a, a hard stop. I want to make sure we're, we're absolutely done by uh, 90 minutes from now. It's 5 o'clock here in California, so by 6.30, we, we're definitely going to finish up. In the next couple of days, you'll get a few things. Um, this webinar, like all the webinars I do, is being recorded. So don't worry if you don't make it to the end. Uh, you will get a recording, that you, a link to the recording. You can download that, uh, listen to it at your, your heart's content. Uh, during the webinar, uh, Dr. Kaczynski is going to be demonstrating a, a number of products that he uses, which are exclusive to Golden Dent. These webinars don't come together without a sponsor. And Golden Dent and I have been working together for years. It takes a lot of effort to, to find a speaker, to, to help develop the content, to help get those invitations out to everyone. Uh, as I said, I've been doing working with them for years. Um, they have as much of a commitment to dental education as anyone out there. So thank you to them. Uh, at the uh, When Dr. Kaczynski is done speaking, uh, Kurt Lawler from Golden Dent is going to come on. He will uh, talk about uh, some of the educational opportunities, talk about some of the specials they have, and then we'll get into the Q&A. Uh, speaking of Golden Dent, after every one of these webinars, I always get emails about uh, the CE, Canadian Education Credits. I'll mention it a couple times this evening. Uh, Golden Dent does send those out. I send them a list of everyone that attended the webinar. Attended the webinar means you were here for the bulk of the webinar. If you pop on for two minutes and pop off, you, you, you didn't attend. You, you're not going to get a CE form. Uh, as most of you can imagine, to, to go through that list and get out CE forms to 1,100 people, that can take a while, up to a few weeks. So please be patient. Um, they always send them out. There's no test at the end. There's nothing you need to do. As long as you're here and you stay on for it, you will be sent that CE form. So with that out of the way, it gives me great pleasure once again to welcome back Dr. Timothy Kaczynski. Uh, he's an affiliated adjunct clinical professor at the University of Detroit Mercy School of Dentistry. He's on the editorial review board of Reality Magazine. He's a past editor of the Michigan Academy of General Dentistry. He's currently the associate editor of the AGD journals and is honored to have been named uh, editor of Implants Today. Not sure how he's time to practice if he's editing all these journals, but <laughs> he's very busy with other stuff. Um, he's past president of the Michigan Academy of General Dentistry. Uh, he got his DDS from the University of Detroit uh, Mercy Dental School. He got a mastership in biochemistry from Wayne State University. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Oral Implantology and Implant Dentistry. Uh, ICOI, the American Society of Osteointegration, which is good since we're talking about implants tonight. He's a fellow of the Dent uh, fellow of the American Academy of Implant Dentistry. Uh, he's got a mastership in the AGD. He's received numerous honors, including fellowship in the American and International Colleges of Dentists in the Academy of Dentistry International. About three years ago, he got the Academy of Dentistry International's Humanitarian Award. Uh, he's a member of OKU and the Pierre Fauchard Academy. He was a University of Detroit Mercy School of Dentistry Alumni Association Alumnus of the Year uh, twice in two, oh, actually no, it's one, it, 
2009, 2014, and 2020, he received the Academy of General Dentistry's Lifelong Learning and Service Recognition Award. He's placed uh, over 14,000 dental implants. He's published over 200 articles uh, all about implant, all the prosthetic phases, surgical phases as well. He's been a contributor to textbooks like Principles and Practices of Implant Dentistry, um, and one back a few years ago uh, in 2010, Dental Implantation and Technology. Any of you that have ever looked at uh, the Noble BioCare's Noble Vision series uh, are familiar with him because he's featured on there as well. He lectures extensively. I hope I left some time for you to actually do the presentation, Tim. So without further ado, uh, Tim, it was great to have you back. We're looking forward to tonight's presentation. <laughs> Lauren, Lauren, you always make me smile. Thank you so much, and and good to hear that um, that that you're safe and everybody's safe. And and these these virtual education programs um, are important right now. Um, you know, it's hard to travel. Uh, you know, I should have been gone 42 weekends this year lecturing around the country. And uh, obviously with, with COVID uh, hitting, it kind of put a squash on, on most of those travels. So um, let's get started. So one, one of the topics that, that we found to be uh, very interested, interesting to, to many of our, our um, uh, colleagues is the immediate implant. Um, and how do we do that? What does that mean, immediate implant? It means we're taking a tooth out or teeth out and we're placing an implant into the socket created by that extraction site. And um, it works very well. I, I really like doing that. Um, obviously, it's uh, convenient for the patient in that it's a one-step surgical procedure. Um, but there are some rules that, that must be followed to ensure success. And for those of you who had heard me with Lauren in, in past webinars, um, we, we've talked about grafting procedures and things like that. And you've heard me say that, that we can predictably grow bone today. Uh, it, and it's an amazing concept, but there are certain rules and, and regulations that must be followed to, to ensure success. And in today's program for the next uh, 45 minutes, as Lauren said, or 50 minutes, um, I just want to demonstrate some of the techniques that I use. And, and there are many, many ways of, of doing exactly what I do. Uh, we're, we're not going to promote a particular implant system necessarily. Uh, we are going to, to, to talk about the products that I use. Um, rather than talk about a myriad of products, I'm going to show you what, what works well in my hands and the techniques that I use to get the predictable results uh, that I expect. So for those of you out there who, who um, are interested in immediate implant placement, uh, I'm gonna, just going to show you the techniques that I use and, and hopefully you, you will uh, achieve the same positive results that, that I'm able to, uh, to achieve. Um, you know, as Lauren said, um, I practice in, outside of Detroit in Bingham Farms and um, I, I do publish a lot. We do a lot of video demonstrations, a lot of YouTube. And for those of you who may be uh, interested in, in seeing some of the publications that we've accomplished, we do have an educational website, uh, drkosinski.com. Uh, and so I do try to post um, our videos, our demonstrations um, uh, for you. Uh, and you're, you're more than welcome to observe that uh, educational site at your leisure. Um, our objectives, we're going to talk a little bit about atraumatic extraction techniques, um, working with specifically about the physics forcep, which is an instrument that I certainly would not practice without, uh, with, the, with the idea that we want to preserve bone and soft tissue, we want to create emergence profile um, of our final restorations. Uh, again, for those of you who heard me before or have seen my publications, I'm a, I'm a big advocate of, of tooth up or tooth down uh, surgical protocol, meaning we're trying to design the final restoration prior to any surgical intervention of our dental implant. Um, so socket preservation techniques are, are, are critical as our proper um, reflection or flap design. We'll talk about a couple different uh, grafting materials, a couple different membranes that I use, and a little bit about the suturing techniques uh, that we use to achieve um, form and function with our final uh, implant restorations. But again, to specifically talk about the, the topic today, we're going to talk about uh, immediate um, implant placement and what we need to do to achieve uh, maximum results. 
So, um, you know, let's let's look at a, a situation. A patient lost a um, uh, anterior maxillary tooth. Um, obviously, there appears to have been a significant amount of infection in that area, which created a significant defect. And um, the, the defect was curetted and a grafting material was placed uh, into the socket. Um, and after about four months, we can see some some changes occurring um, in that grafted site uh, in preparation for placement of a, of a dental implant. Um, before I begin, I wanted to talk about um, uh, a rinse that is available through Golden Dent that you may be very interested in, in purchasing. Uh, if, we, if we all remember when, when, when COVID first hit at the end of March, uh, we were all scurrying to find the, the correct protocol to protect our, ourselves, our staff, uh, the staff's family, and of course our patients. And um, you know everything uh, was out of circulation from paper towels to uh, Clorox wipes to disinfectants. Um, and so we want to to control the bacteria count, obviously, in our in our pre-surgical sites. And and for years we we use chlorhexidine rinse to again to decrease the bacterial count prior to uh, a surgical placement. Um, now we never use chlorhexidine in a socket site because the the material would kill the osteoclast, which would inhibit bone formation. But we would we would again try to limit the bacterial count. With chlorhexidine. However, chlorhexidine has not been shown uh, in anything that I've read to, uh, to affect uh, the COVID virus or the spread of the COVID, COVID virus. <laughs> and so many of us <laughs> have switched to um, a hydrogen peroxide solution or diluting hydrogen peroxide and having our patients rinse with that, again, to decrease the aerosol uh, of, the, of the, the potential aerosol, aerosol of the virus. Um, and this is a, a fairly new product um, that I think that um, may be beneficial and maybe at the end, uh, Kurt with Golden Dental um, can, can give you some more information about, um, about the product and purchasing it. But again, it is an uh, oral rinse that we're using preoperatively, again, to decrease the, the viral uh, aerosol uh, creation. And the research, there's a lot of research from Utah State University uh, on this material. So it, it's been it proven to, uh, to work pretty effectively uh, in a very short amount of time with a, with a very uh, short uh, swishing by our patients. But let's get back to our, our clinical procedure. So remember we had, I, I showed you the radiograph, we had a, a infected tooth that was removed, it was grafted. Uh, and the graft looks like it after four months, uh, was not completely um, uh, uh, integrated uh, into, into bone formation. But uh, intraorally, we look at the soft tissue and we can see a site that uh, we want to consider for a dental implant placement. So um, as, as we have demonstrated in the past, um, I love using an Orban knife. I love using the instruments from Golden Dent. We, we created a, a nice uh, grafting kit that is very cost-effective, very, very high uh, quality. Um, uh, this is a, a plasma vapor deposited coating uh, on our instruments, which keep them very, very sharp uh, and, and scratch resistant. Um, our reflection design is, is very important. Uh, it's critical with any implant that we have a band of attached gingiva of at least two millimeters. So as we're injecting uh, and infiltrating the site, uh, we want to evaluate the mucogingival line that is created. Uh, we want to ensure, again, that we have a, a, a significant band of attached gingiva, or at least two millimeters of attached gingiva. So here I've simply taken this uh, Orban knife, which is a speci specially designed instrument, um, very sharp, uh, and I'm using it to make my incision. And again, I'm referring to some past um, webinars that we've done with Lauren. Um, we, we want to make a clean incision and we're going to, to make what, what I refer to as an envelope reflection, meaning I'm not making any vertical incisions here. I'm going to go around the teeth and uh, as if we had a number 10 envelope and lifted the, um, the uh, flap, we would blow into it. Uh, it gives me ideal control, but allows me to see the surgical site or the hard tissue 
very, very efficiently. Uh, incisions into attached gingiva does not hurt. We know that bone is not innervated. Uh, bone does not have pain receptors in it. We do have nerves that run through bone that we have to, to understand. Um, we don't wanna damage any, any viable nerves, but bone itself does not hurt. So the only thing we need to do is really infiltrate uh, or numb the soft tissue in this site. Um, we want to try to eliminate incisions into the mucosal tissue. Once we incise into mucosal tissue, and many of us would make a, a vertical incision uh, around the tooth or in the center of the tooth or, or in the uh, interdental papilla area um, into mucosa. Once we, once we incise into mucosa, the patient is going to experience discomfort. Prostaglandin and histamine is released and uh, the patients are going to be uncomfortable. But if you can keep your incision in attached gingiva, it is amazing how um, minimally invasive this is uh, for the patient and how we're able to, to uh, control any discomfort that the patient may have with this procedure. So here we, we made an incision. Uh, we do have a band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect, and I'm simply going to take a periosteal elevator, again, from my, our Golden Dent uh, grafting kit, and we're, we're reflecting the area. And here you can clearly see um, that we have a, a fairly thin ridge in that area. Um, I want to be able to see um, the available hard tissue, especially in the pre-maxillary area or in the aesthetic zone. The biggest mistakes I think that, that we make, we, all of us make, uh, is we, we prefer to do a flapless procedure or a, um, a punch situation, and we have a tendency to place our implants too far facially. Uh, and this is not acceptable, and this is what uh, results in some of our, um, our retreatments of our dental implants. So I'm reflecting the tissue, and um, I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, make my osteotomy. And to do that, we start with a pilot burr. Every, every implant system has a pilot burr. This happens to be a 2.2 diameter burr. Um, I'm looking at uh, positioning that implant where we would get emergence of that tooth. I'm thinking tooth down in this situation. Um, we're going to correct our angulation, mesial distal, buccolingually. Um, I widen the osteotomy, but I'm going to undersize, um, undersize the osteotomy, meaning that the implant is going to be larger than the hole that I made inside the bone. So the, the implant itself will actually push the bone facially and palatally to some degree. Now, we do have a defect in that area, and when we have a significant defect, um, I will use an allograft material, and here we're using the Goldoss particulate, uh, which is a very, very nice material. It's, it's, it's my go-to material. Um, it increases the osteoinductive and osteoconductive surface area, which uh, helps accelerate cellular growth. Now, we know that, that all skeletal bone demonstrates volume stability over time, except our dental alveolar bone. Um, and why is that? Because the dental alveolus is very labile in the absence of loading. So we have to stimulate this, uh, the, our dental alveolar bone to stimulate bone growth. And bone grafting is possible because bone tissue, unlike most other tissues, has the ability to regenerate completely if provided the space into which to grow. As native bone grows, it will generally replace the graft material completely, resulting in a fully integrated region of new bone. And the, we, we understand that the biologic mechanisms of bone growth are osteogenesis, osteoinduction. Osteoinduction is the ability to stimulate cells capable of formulating uh, bone cells like bone morphogenic proteins, platelet-derived growth factors, et cetera. And osteoconduction is simply a structure that uh, is created to support or scaffold bone de development. So it's like stone and concrete. The important thing that you have to tell your patients is that we're not, we're not pouring concrete in this area. It doesn't just get hard. Rather, it's a, a physiologic response of the body where osteoclasts will attack and eat away the bone and stimulate osteoblasts behind it to lay down new bone. Grafting is critical. 
Uh, grafting will help prevent bone loss. It'll help support the soft tissue, which I'll demonstrate in a moment. Um, it can prevent periodontal uh, pathology, and it can actually provide an adequate site for implants in a relatively short amount of time, in three or four months. If we do these procedures without grafting, we can get soft tissue infiltration. We can actually get significant loss of vertical height uh, and width of, of the available uh, site. And the literature will say that uh, without grafting, we will get 30 to 60% bone loss in a three-year period, and which means that the patient may require future uh, grafting procedures uh, in the future, which may be um, cost prohibitive. So uh, we'll take the gold ass uh, particulate, and this happens to be a mineralized cortical cancellous material, and I will wet it with sterile water or sterile saline. Now you never mix uh, your, your graft material with um, anesthetic. Anesthetic has a very, very low pH, it's very acidic, and it will inhibit, it will inhibit uh, um, osteoclastic activity and future bone growth. So for those of you who may have used anesthetic in your, to wet a, your grafting material and did not have good results, you know why now. So we're actually able to, to wet the material, which makes it sort of like a gel or a putty. And I'm going to actually physically uh, place this material on the facial aspect of my implant to kind of plump out that tissue. Um, when we use an allograft material, it's important that we protect the graft from invagination of epithelium. Now, epithelium will grow about 10 times faster than bone. And so it's always a race, and epithelium is always going to win. So we will use a, a membrane or, or um, barrier to protect that graft from invagination of epithelium. And one of my favorite materials that's available through Golden Dent is called EpiGuide. Um, it is a synthetic material. Uh, it's three layers of uh, uh, polylactic acid, um, and it will be maintained for 20 weeks. Uh, before resorbing. It is a resorbable material, and you do not need primary closure. These are really important considerations. Now, to have bone growth, we must protect the allograft for a minimum of six weeks. We must protect that graft for a minimum of six weeks. So it's imperative that I show you how to specifically place this membrane to protect that graft. We made an a, um, envelope reflection. I need to see any defect clearly. And I must place my membrane at least two millimeters beyond any defect. That membrane must be placed passively. And now I know I'm a general dentist and I know many of us uh, who have tried grafting procedure of taking courses, we try to force that membrane into position. We tear, we cut it, um, we rip it. That's not acceptable. We want predictability. We can grow bone on the facial aspect of our implant 100% of the time if we protect that, that allograft from invagination of epithelium. So make your reflection, make it excessive so that you can see the defect and place that membrane beyond any defect that's there. So we, we plumped out the, the, uh, the site, the facial aspect, and here I'm passively placing my, my membrane beyond the defect, I'm just protecting that graft material, and I'm just tucking it to the palatal aspect. You can see I'm not forcing this. I don't have to, to push or tug or rip. You can see that because we did not make any vertical incisions, that reflection lays perfectly flat, um, which allows us to suture it. And you can also see how we plumped out that uh, facial aspect or labial aspect of that surgical site quite effectively. Now, suturing is very important. Um, and, and some of our suturing programs have been, been the, one of the most, some of the most popular ones. Um, I use a, we use a reverse cutting needle in dentistry. And I like the Vicryl or PGA polyglycolic acid synthetic material. Uh, it's braided. It will last up to 28 days. I like to see my surgical patients uh, a week to 10 days. Oftentimes, when we do a, uh, a surgical procedure, uh, the patients do very, very well for a couple few days, 
And if you don't tell them, they'll call and say, something's wrong. I was fine and now it's starting to hurt. And what's happening is the epithelium, the tissue wants to heal and the sutures are preventing it. Um, what I like about the PGA material, it, it resorbs to uh, water. So it, it's not very inflammatory. Other sutures are silk, which I don't use anymore, plain gut or chromic gut. Um, and again, uh, in dentistry, we, we use reverse cutting needles. I'll use a 3.0 or 4.0. And I will have two different uh, diameters or uh, radius of, of needles, a 3A circles and a half a circle, depending on the situation um, of, of what we're trying to use. Um, Golden Dent has excellent um, PGA sutures. Um, they're they're um, um, dyed uh, purple, and they are very, very cost effective. Um, for those of you who are doing surgery, please look at this. I, I don't exactly know what package um, Kurt with, with Golden Dent is putting together for you, uh, but this material is probably half the cost of most of the Vicryl sutures uh, on the market today that we're, we're purchasing. Um, and a great suture book um, is Lil, uh, Lee Silverstein's The Suture Book. Um, and I would suggest that you get this from Salvin Dental, S-A-L-V-I-N Dental. Uh, don't go to Amazon or whatever, they charge hundreds of dollars for it. It's a $100 book, but it will really help you in your suturing techniques. Um, very briefly, I wanted to demonstrate how we're doing this. Remember, we put graft and we put a membrane passively on the facial aspect, over the ridge, onto the palatal, so that it lays completely flat. Now, many of us would suture from the facial to the palatal. And oftentimes what happens is we engage the membrane. Okay, that's not a problem. But when the patient does come back and we remove the suture or our staff removes the suture, they'll pull that mem membrane out. And again, talking in concentric circles, it's imperative that that membrane remain intact passively for at least six weeks. What that means is that that membrane comes out before six weeks, the case becomes unpredictable. The case becomes unpredictable. I don't know if we're gonna grow bone. But again, um, we'll take this reverse cutting needle and you can see how I'm, I'm penetrating. I'm going from the crestal aspect from, this, from the incision aspect towards the facial. And because this is a reverse cutting needle, it's, it's going to slide over the top of that membrane, not engaging it. Then I'm simply going to turn that needle around and I'm going to go from the crestal aspect to the palatal, again, sliding over the top of that membrane, not engaging it whatsoever. And here I simply made two simple interrupted sutures. And I'll just do a little cross-link suture, again, from crestal to facial. Come back around from crestal to palatal, and we get closure. I'm not caring so much about primary closure because this is a long-lasting, resorbable membrane. You can see I still have a significant band of attached gingiva. So we followed every single rule that we talked about in the aesthetic zone in a very challenging situation. The implant is placed and will uh, allow to integrate for about four months. The patient uh, wore a removable uh, flipper or uh, uh, transitional appliance. Uh, again, it's not engaging the, the tissue whatsoever. Patient comes back in one week. I will clip the sutures and you can see how uh, we're starting to get initial healing uh, in that site. Let's go to the maxillary anterior. Let's talk about extractions and grafting and immediate implant placement. Um, very typical um, uh, young man who had some, some serious uh, decay. These teeth uh, were deemed non-restorable. And we are going to go through the process of extracting, grafting, and placing an implant. And again, I will go to my Golden Dent uh, series of surgical instruments. These are periotomes. Again, uh, the plasma vapor deposited coating on these uh, make them very, very long lasting. Uh, I'm simply going around the uh, periodontal ligament of these teeth. 
And this is the physics forcep. This is a, a series of instruments. For those of you who are not familiar, uh, I strongly recommend that you contact Golden Dent to get uh, more specific information or go back to one of our, our past webinars. Uh, it's a series of four instruments, a upper right, upper anterior, upper left, lower universal. And it is um, simply a, a, um, an instrument that allows me to remove teeth uh, fairly atraumatically or minimally traumatically. Uh, it consists of two components, the beak, which is a shovel-shaped edge, which will, in this situation, engage the palatal aspect of the root, one to three millimeters subgingival, and then the bumper, which has a little silicone covering on it, will be placed as high up the vestibule as possible. It is not the working end of the instrument. It is, it is not holding the facial plate of bone. Rather, it's serving simply as a center of rotation uh, or a fulcrum which allows me to, to uh, create tension on the lingual aspect or palatal aspect of the root by simply um, uh, using finger pressure and rotating my wrist in this situation towards the corner of the eye. Uh, you're never squeezing the instrument. It's truly not a forcep. It's more of a, of a luxator. And this tooth, this tension created on the palatal aspect of the tooth will create a physiologic response. We will get an enzymatic release, which will break down the periodontal ligament. What's holding the, what's holding the tooth in position? The periodontal ligament. And if the periodontal ligament is melted away physiologically, the tooth will then disengage up and out of the socket, uh, maintaining the facial plate of bone miraculously. So again, we have a bumper guard. The beak is the working end of the instrument. We're engaging the palatal aspect of the tooth, placing the bumper as high up the vestibule as possible, acting as a center of rotation. I'm not squeezing the handles. I'm simply using finger pressure and rotating my wrist towards the corner of the left eye in this situation. And in a matter of 30 seconds, 40 seconds, that tooth will disengage. Uh, it is the, the simplest, extraction tool that I've ever used. And I think it's imperative that we, we save our body. There's, there's no uh, shoulder force. There's no uh, bicep, uh, forearm pressure whatsoever. Uh, it's simply uh, um, a lever that is used to remove the tooth. The tooth will then pop. Uh, you won't hear a pop, but it disengages up and out. The instrument is not intended to remove the tooth in total. Rather, it's intended to luxate the tooth up and out of the socket. I will then take what we refer to as a tooth delivery instrument and remove that tooth in total, maintaining the facial plate of bone to a high degree. Cuspid teeth can be difficult, can be challenging. The same protocol is used. We will engage the beak on the paddle aspect of the tooth, place the bumper as high up the vestibule as possible, without squeezing the handle, simply rotating my wrist, creating tension on the palatal aspect of this tooth. <clears throat> it will disengage, and you can see we were able to remove this tooth fairly atraumatically or minimally traumatically. What's really amazing is the patient's response are, are just so positive. They, um, they don't feel that, that constant pressure from our more conventional extraction techniques. Um, and, and they're amazed that we're able to remove the tooth. So it's, it's a very, very nice patient management, patient marketing uh, instrument. First thing you need to do um, is to make sure that there's no uh, infected tissue. So we're going to take our curette, again, from the Golden Dent um, grafting kit that we created, and we're simply curetting, 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 curetting. We want bleeding to those sites. Um, Purple blood is bad, red blood is good. Um, if we do not have bleeding, we may want to create bleeding by taking uh, number six round burr and creating um, uh, purchase points or bleeding points in the available bone. For education, uh, if we have a facial plate of bone, certainly we can move forward. But if you want to be sure, let's go back to our reflection. Again, using the Orban knife, which is a specially designed instrument, I'm making my incision around the teeth, not, not, doing, not making any vertical incisions into mucosa. We're trying to maintain the site. 
and we're reflecting. Now, this is very important. Do you see the defect there? And do you see the, the infection? That's pretty significant. I did not create this defect. The, the infected tooth created the defect. And the facial aspect, the, the facial bone can be very, very thin in certain situations. So curette, all of that granulation out, you can clearly visualize the defect here. And what did I say earlier? We want to um, uh, graft the site. We're gonna place an implant immediately. And we must protect that, that, that um, site, that graft from invagination of epithelium, but by using a membrane, a long lasting membrane that needs to last at least six weeks. But to do that, I must place that membrane passively at, le at least six, two millimeters, at least two millimeters beyond the defect. So using an implant protocol, again, um, the, the type of implant really is irrelevant here. We happen to be using the Han implant system from Glidewell Lab, but we start with a small burr here, a 2.4 diameter burr, and our position is very, very specific. We're not placing the implant directly into the socket site because that facial plate of bone is very, very thin. Rather, your initial penetration is about three millimeters palatal to the facial aspect of the adjacent teeth. So we're actually engaging the palatal wall and going beyond the apex of the, the root of the tooth. Our initial stability of our dental implants are, is on the apical two millimeters. We're gonna widen the osteotomy and continue to wide, widen the osteotomy. Now, another, mem, uh, another graph material that I really like uh, a lot, and I think that you should certainly talk to Kurt with Golden Dent uh, and see if he can, in, uh, include this in your package. It's called the Osteogen Plug. And it's a combination of bioactive crystal particulate uh, in a, a purified collagen matrix. Um, uh, it's a bovine collagen matrix. Um, it makes socket preservation easy. It's a very, very inexpensive material, uh, 40 or $50 a plug, as opposed to $110 for a bottle of allograph material. Um, it's not collagen. It does have its calcium appetite in a uh, bovine collagen, uh, bovine tendon uh, collagen uh, carrier. And it fulfills two primary purposes. It can be used as the membrane also. The consistency of that uh, Achilles tendon, bovine Achilles tendon matrix prevents uh, invagination of epithelium into it. So the epithelium, it's a race between bone from the apex towards the crest and epithelium from the crest towards the apex. Um, the epithelium has two choices. It can either go into the graft or it can slide along the top of it. And because of the consistency of the material, we do not need a membrane and the epithelium will grow on top of it. So it restricts migration of connective tissue through a physical and chemical barrier. Um, you're going to use it like a plug. You'll actually place it firmly, but we're not we're not condensing it like amalgam. So I'm taking this this material, which has a certain amount of consistency, and I'm actually placing it into my socket. Now remember, I already made my osteotomy here, and I'm placing it firmly, and you can see the blood is absorbing into it. And I'm going to pack it again in my grafting kit. We have a nice plugger. We're packing it firmly, not crushing it. And you can see the defect is, is corrected. And I'm simply going to thread my, uh, here the Han implant system directly into the socket. Now, that the socket that has the graft material um, embedded in it. The material will move out of the way and it will fill in any defects, almost like, like caulking. The implant is placed about a millimeter subcrestal. It's torqued into position. And then we did our osteotomy on our second implant with the same uh, protocol, um, small burr, wider burr, wider burr to a wider burr. I place my plug and I'm simply threading the implant. Now here we have an extracted, grafted, immediately placed implant and we torqued it to 45 Newton centimeters. That's incredible torque 
uh, in a, in a uh, defected site. And you can see the graph material actually fills in the, plot, the area very, very nicely, a la um, caulking. I'm going to go ahead and put our, our cover screws or closure caps uh, into the implant. And here, um, the osteogen also comes in sheets. And what I wanted to do was, was to kind of plump out that tissue to some degree. And um, um, this almost acts like a membrane because, because the, again, epithelium is not going to grow into it. Um, and I'm using this, this material to plump out the site. Then I'm going to go through my suturing techniques that we demonstrated earlier, making sure that we're not grabbing onto the membrane itself. Here we're doing a horizontal mattress, just being a little bit fancy. And simply suturing this site. Um, I'm not so much concerned about primary closure. I'm more concerned about the width of the band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect. Our implants are placed the bottom millimeter subcrestal. Again, that is a physiologic positioning because we ex expect bone to shrink about a millimeter in the healing process in an immediate extraction site. And here we made a, um, a removable appliance that is not. Um, um, putting pressure on my extracted sites. One week post-op, you can see how um, the tissue is healing. One month post-op, the tissues are healing very, very nicely, which will allow us to restore very well. A Couple more cases, uh, Lauren, if you don't mind, um, and we'll get into some questions. Again, a non-restorable tooth that needs to be extracted. Um, with our mandibular molar teeth, because they have um, uh, divergent roots, I will section those roots and remove them individually as if they were um, single rooted uh, bicuspid roots. So I'm going, I'm using a, a 557 surgical burr through the furcation area, making sure that we, we cut all the way through. And again, using my physics forcep, my favorite instrument in my practice. I'm engaging the lingual aspect, one to three millimeter subgingival, placing the bumper um, down into the vestibule. Again, I'm not squeezing the instrument, I'm simply rotating my wrist without squeezing the instrument uh, towards the shoulder. And in a matter of seconds, that tooth will disengage up and out of the socket. I will then take my tooth delivery and remove uh, this root that again has some divergence. Um, some ingulation to it makes a challenging extraction really quite simple. Take a radiograph, make sure that all roots are removed. Doctors, I, I can't tell you how many times I see root tips left. I know extracting teeth can be very, very challenging and very difficult and very frustrating. Um, the physics forcep has eliminated a lot of that stress uh, in my life uh, and the technique is just brilliant. Again, I want to, to, to visualize the entire site. So I'm going to take my Orban knife and you can clearly see the defect that wasn't created, was created physiologically. I'm going to go ahead and immediately place an implant. Again, I'm using um, a small burr to a wider burr to a wider burr. I'm thinking tooth up in this situation. So I'm maximizing the exact position of that implant. I'm going to widen the osteotomy. I'm going to place my implant, but we have a defect. We have the mesial and distal root and we have that little bit of a facial defect. We're going to graft our, our, uh, with our graft material, immediate post-operative radiograph. You can see our implant is in nice position. We're going to correct the defect. And what do we have to do? We have to, it's imperative that we protect that graft material from invagination of epithelium. And here we're using um, another membrane from Golden Dent. Um, it is a, 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 a porcine collagen material, uh, rather stiff, nice material to work with, allows me to really create a wall and protect my allograft from invagination of epithelium. And we suture close. I, I'm not so much concerned about primary closure, Immediate um, um, 
a radiograph of the of the site. <clears throat> you can see the the material is rather radio opaque at this level. One week post op, three months post op. You can see how we have a band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect. We have a healthy uh, tissue uh, healing site. Let's look at one week post op very importantly. What is that yellow? Make sure you explain to the patient that's our our membrane. And we want that to stay there. Remember, epithelium grows about a half a millimeter to a millimeter a day. So within a week or so, that area is going to completely close over. The patient should be um, maintaining it. Um, I, I like them to use maybe um, a Q-tip with hydrogen peroxide. You don't want to scrub brush it. Stay away from crunchy foods like nacho chips, potato chips, things like that. Um, it will be a little tender. But most patients do not experience a lot of discomfort here. We're, we're giving them 600 milligrams of ibuprofen, ibuprofen three times a day um, for three days, and, and they do very, very well. Um, following um, healing, we uncover the implant. We have a healing abutment, and you can see the, the, the excellent uh, tissue response uh, to the surgical uh, intervention. Uh, and here the laboratory fabricated a nice screw retained uh, zirconia crown uh, that we torqued in the position at 35 newton centimeters and covered over with uh, composite material. Uh, Lauren, if it's okay, I'm going to show one more case. Um, I know I have a tendency to talk uh, quickly, but I know we have questions uh, and we want to give Kurt a chance to, uh, to discuss with our attendees um, uh, what, what's available. So let's look at another atraumatic extraction situation. Uh, this is a, a referral to me, um, and a patient had fractured uh, the maxillary cuspid tooth, um, post and core and crown, um, and we had obviously had other dentistry, uh, mesial and distal to this tooth. Um, we probably do more individual implants on teeth that have a root canals and posts than anything else. We actually had a horizontal fracture, and you can actually see it uh, right at the level of that, of that post. Uh, making that tooth uh, um, non-savable. Um, a, a CT indicates that the facial plate of bone uh, in this area is extremely thin, uh, eggshell thin, uh, so to speak. Um, we use the physics forcep, and I was able to remove this tooth atraumatically. Now, um, we, we maintain the facial plate of, of bone. Here, I took a post-op CT just for educational purposes. And I want you to clearly see that that facial plate of bone is there. So with the physics forcep, we can do fairly atraumatic um, uh, procedures, atraumatic extractions. But we do have a little dehiscence right at the apex where that, that root had a curvature to it. <clears throat> we take a, a, a digital radiograph to ensure that the root was taken out in total. And here I made that, that envelope reflection for you to il illustrate that the facial plate of bone is indeed still intact. Um, we went ahead and did our osteotomy. Now, we did have a dehiscence right at the apex, so I have to be able to see that dehiscence, and I'm going to place my membrane, this happens to be the epi guide again, at least two millimeters beyond that defect. I'm going to graft on the facial aspect, and I'm, I'm simply tucking over that membrane onto the palatal. Everything is very passive. I do not care about primary closure because this is a high quality, long-lasting membrane. Post-operative CT shows that our implant is not exactly where the socket was. Rather, we positioned it three millimeters palatal to the facial aspect of the adjacent teeth, and uh, the doctor was able to restore it with a custom abutment and a final restoration. The periodontal health around this implant is actually better than uh, around the natural uh, teeth that, that were restored. Lauren, do we still have a few more seconds? Um, can I show one more case, or did you want to stop? No, nope, go for it, Tim. I mean, uh, okay, yeah, we're you know, at least we got um, another five or ten minutes. You know, for you to oh, show fantastic. one more case. Fantastic. Let's just do one more case then. So here, you know, again, a very very uh, challenging extraction, I, I would say. Uh, we have a, a um, um, angulation of our root that could make this difficult. We have significant decay. And I, and I challenge our, our attendees, how would you remove this tooth normally? 
I, I would say that most of us would probably take a, a periotome or a periosteal elevator and go around the tooth uh, into the PDL. Uh, you would take a, an elevator or a luxator uh, and you would go in between the teeth and you would, you would try to get that tooth to move a little bit, being very careful that you don't damage the, the, uh, the crown work on either side of that space. Um, then you would take some type of forcep, squeeze the heck out of it, and do figure eights or mesial distal or buccal lingual and hope that you don't fracture that root. I know that we fracture roots. I know that roots are left in the mouth, which makes my job uh, as an implant guy uh, very, very challenging. Um, so non-restorable tooth, gross decay. I, again, use my golden dent periotome. Uh, to go around to to establish a purchase point and I'm using my my uh, physics forcep engaging the palatal aspect of the root one to three millimeters subgingival not squeezing the instrument whatsoever with sing, simple rotation of my wrist the tooth will luxate up and out I'm taking my tooth delivery and I'm able to remove that tooth a traumatically uh, 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 very nicely uh, without damaging the, the facial aspect of the tooth. I'm using that tooth root to actually measure the length of implant that I'd like to use. Um, I'm going to go ahead here. I'm using my osteogen plug again. And if you remember, we curetted. We have a bleeding site. Red blood is good. Purple blood is bad. I'm placing my material into the socket firmly. I'm not condensing it like amalgam, but I'm placing it firmly and I'm able to place my implant into that socket very predictably. The material is pushed to the sides of the, of the socket, a la caulking, and I'm able to um, uh, uh, take a, a post-operative radiograph illustrating the, the, the defect that was created in the implant placement. One month post-op, four months post-op, we have a healthy situation and we're able to fabricate an abutment and final crown uh, that is very functional uh, and does have some sense of emergence profile for the patient. Here it's a screw retained uh, prosthesis. Um, one thing that, that I'd like to mention here, if it, it really has nothing to do with immediate placement, but uh, many of us have, have uh, seen the situation. If we have an implant mesial to a natural tooth, Oftentimes we will see that, that, that natural tooth distal to the implant uh, move distally and create a, um, an open contact, which is very annoying to the patient. Patient comes back and says they have a food trap and we as dentists feel horrible about it. The literature will say an implant is like a post in concrete where a tooth is like a post in dirt. When we have an edentulous space, the, the, the distal tooth will migrate mesially. Once the implant is restored, we may have a, a nice contact. The literature will say that 50% of the time, that natural tooth will migrate distally, creating the open contact. So what that means to me is in my restorations, um, whether it be a, a cementon or a screw retained, I will put a transitional or temporary restoration here in that access hole and allow the patient to wear it for a month, two months, or till their next um, um, hygiene visit to ensure that that distal tooth doesn't migrate, creating an open contact. It's not that we're doing anything wrong, it's a physiologic reaction. And doctors, I advise you to explain that to your patients uh, when you do these restorations. It makes you look smart. Most of the dental labs, if that's the case, these crown, the implant crown would have to be remade, um, but that's not the patient's responsibility. Uh, and I know we work with Glidewell Lab. They would replace it for us um, with, without any question. So uh, Lauren, I, I hope uh, I'm good with time and I'm sure we have some questions. Um, and I, I know we wanted to give some time to Kurt tonight also. Uh, to talk about his uh, materials and products. Correct. And as, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, these webinars don't just come together on their own. It, it takes a lot of time and energy. Uh, we absolutely need to work with a sponsor that can make sure that we get great speakers like Dr. Kosinski, that can get the invitations out, handle the CE. 
Um, speaking of CE, just to remind everyone that, that may have come on a little bit late, if you were here for the bulk of the webinar, you will be sent a CE form. There's nothing you need to do, uh, no test that needs to be taken. It gets sent out automatically. You don't need to email me. It can take up to a few weeks because we, as I said, we had well over a thousand people registered. Um, but in order to, to do some of the things that Dr. Kaczynski talked about, we need to talk about how you learn how to do it and, of course, making sure you've got the right instrumentarium, um, you, know, all, you know, all the stuff that you need to be able to, to do these procedures. So I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Kurt Lawler from Golden Dent, um, who will uh, talk about some of those things, uh, make a, a special offer that he always uh, puts together for uh, attendees of the webinar, and then we'll get to the Q&A. So, Kurt, take it away. All right, Lauren, I appreciate it. My name is Kurt Lawler. I'm with Golden Dent uh, here in Detroit. Um, I know when we uh, get the list of the webinar and see who's joined, um, we have a lot of regular uh, uh, attendees that join our webinars each month over and over again. And um, But if you are new, we are here based in Detroit. And uh, the physics forceps is what started our company in 2007. And we've stuck with that philosophy of, of trying to uh, provide simple, predictable, and unconventional or unique products um, that clinically work. And so that's what we do here in uh, Detroit. And it says 80 years of Detroit Dental because we're, um, we're a third generational uh, dental family here in Detroit. So uh, we usually do a promotional offer, which I will do again uh, this evening. Uh, we appreciate everybody investing their time with us this evening. Um, we know, um, like I said, you invested an hour with us. If there's anything that was interesting or uh, piqued some interest on in what Dr. Kaczynski is using in his practice, um, we want to give you an opportunity to try those products and then also save um, when you do uh, purchase those products. So it's going to be a 15% off code. Um, that's actually better than we've done um, in a while. So I encourage anybody to take advantage of that. And the promo code is SAVE15. Um, our website's on there. And then uh, we'll, we'll send an email following the uh, the webinar too with this information in the uh, replay link. We do these deals uh, quickly. So 50% off is actually good. It's actually, um, I think the same or a little bit better than we even did for the Black Friday deals. Um, so it's actually the best deal we've done um, for this year so far. And so we do them uh, for quick deals. So it's a 24 hour special and expires uh, tomorrow, uh, December 9th. Um, so like I said, it's a 24 hour deal. You can call us in the office if you have any questions about anything and we'll be happy to, to help you out. So I'm gonna go over just kind of uh, some of the products we discussed very quickly. Um, I'll try to get through this quickly. Th this, is a, this is pretty technical. Um, this is the new rinse that we have. Um, it's been popular. Uh, if you'll see here on the bottom of the slide, there's a bunch of clinical studies. Uh, it is proven to work. Uh, there's real no user experience with it. It's not like you can try it and, and know that it's working better than, than another product you're maybe using for a rinse or the nasal spray is quite interesting. Um, a lot of dentists have been purchasing that from us if they're uh, doing a certain procedure during the day or if they're even out and about in public. Um, there's a great nasal spray that you can just use um, just to give a little bit more comfort uh, related to um, you know, the environment we're, we're uh, living in with, uh, with COVID. So there's lots of studies. You can take a look. I, I won't get too detailed on this, but it is very proven to work. Um, it's molecular iodine. There's a rinse. It comes in a, a concentrate too. I know some people are putting them in their scalers and uh, uh, like ultrasonic type devices, um, which is interesting. And then there's the rinse and then the nasal spray. So step one, uh, there's you can use whatever works, but obviously to do an immediate implant, you have to extract the tooth atraumatically. Um, in the bottom right corner there, that's what Dr. Kaczynski likes to use. He uses like a bayonet or uh, a straight or a curved uh, separator instrument or a periotome type instrument. Can obviously use like a luxator or there's an instrument we have we just we gave it the name called the wedge um, that's a great pre-step to the atraumatic extraction process the physics forceps is obviously what we like um, there's lots of ways to extract teeth but this is what kind of started it all for our company uh, like i said in 2007 uh, there's four instruments um, this is what i would definitely recommend to start with if you've been looking at the physics forceps or if you've never heard of them um, this is the, the original series and the ones that um, obviously work the best and are the easiest to use. And this will do second molar to second molar on the uh, upper and lower. Um, if you're not into the physics forceps, some people asked us to make more conventional instruments. So some people every once in a while, you'll obviously need to use maybe you know 150 or 151 or upper root tip instrument. Um, we went ahead and made these, uh, gosh, I think about a year ago. Uh, these are nice 
just conventional type extraction instruments. Um, they have some really nice beaks and um, and uh, serrated beaks uh, to uh, to grip the tooth or the root tip. And um, if you wanted to take a look at one of these or need to upgrade some of the more conventional extraction instruments, we do have those available. So I wanted to mention that quickly. Um, this is a great kit for uh, grafting. So I know we showed um, a couple of cases where we were sectioning the tooth um, with like a good cutting burr, uh, but this is really nice uh, tissue and degranulation burr kit. It's also a bone leveling kit um, for the cases where maybe if you can't manually curette the socket site um, with a with a curette uh, instrument, um, the tissue and degranulation burrs are actually quite nice to get into the crevices. They're they're designed where they um, remove the tissue without damaging the bone uh, based on the design of the tip of the burrs. And then the uh, the bone shaping burrs are, are also uh, nice. There's a ball and like a oval shaped burr. Um, this is a good kit for grafting. It's not super expensive. They're obviously not one-time burrs, um, but they sit here in the kit and it's something to uh, maybe take a look at if you are grafting. This is the graft kit. This is a, more of our simple kit. Um, keeps everything together. It's not that expensive. It looks like it's a little under uh, $500. Um, this is going to have everything you need to graft. It keeps it together and organized. Uh, we also have obviously the more advanced instruments if you're looking for um, a more uh, uh, higher end type uh, hemostat or scissors. Uh, we obviously have those available too. These are actually really nice because they're like a snagless suture. Um, you can take a look at those on our website. Um, these are obviously going to be a little bit more expensive than the, the ones I just showed, but they're um, they're also very good. The plugs, uh, these are, this is one of our most popular products. It's um, it, it's very simple to use and the clinical results are very good. So with the promotional discount, um, I, I think Dr. Krasinski mentioned on the webinar it was around $50 a plug. So this the, this discount gets it down to about $42. Uh, the large size is the most popular. Um, there's also a slim uh, shape or size that's uh, shown there on the right-hand side of the slide. Um, but the large is the most popular. It comes in a five pack of uh, plugs and a uh, great product. Uh, we've had that for a while now and uh, the feedback's been really good and a lot of uh, regular customers uh, order this on a regular basis. So Allograph, there, there's a lot of Allograph in the market. Um, ours is obviously a reputable brand and sourced from a reputable location or bone or tissue bank. Um, our pricing's fair on it. It's uh, what uh, of our instructors and opinion leaders we work with like. Uh, it's a, like a 50-50 mineralized cortical cancellous mix. Um, we encourage you to take a look at our bone graft materials. They're um, they're uh, they're very good, and, if, and maybe compare what you're paying now and see if our pricing is a little bit better. Uh, the Epi Guide uh, we talked about that in pretty good detail, so I'll just kind of mention this quickly. We obviously have that available. It's on the left hand side. Um, the only thing to mention it's it's kind of big. It's 18 by 30 in size, so I know um, a lot of offices are actually cutting that uh, membrane um, in advance of the procedure. Uh, sutures. Uh, we have the PGA suture that Dr. Krasinski likes, and then we also have uh, some other sutures. I know he doesn't use the black silk, but if there's something, if there's someone in the webinar this evening that's interested in a black silk suture, um, our, our brand is very inexpensive. It's a good good black silk suture, but our more popular one is the PGA shown at the top. Um, just a couple more slides here, and then I'll get to the Q&A, but this is a uh, if you haven't heard of this, it's called BioViva. This is a really great product to control bleeding. This is more if you're not doing a graft, uh, maybe say like a third molar site, or um, well, like I said, if you're not doing a graft or maybe the patient's um, uh, bleeding quite a bit, it's a hemostatic gauze. It, it, it doesn't have to be taken out or anything. You just set it on the uh, site and it, it turns into like a, a gel almost immediately. And it, it really does a great job controlling bleeding. That's another popular products. I just wanted to mention, mention it as it relates to some of the surgical procedures we discussed this evening. Um, I just have one or two more slides. This is totally off base, but I, I always like the opportunity when I have you know, some of our regular customers on the webinars that maybe don't get our emails or visit our website very often. Um, we recently launched our Golden Dent Endo uh, brand, and uh, we have uh, files, pins, posts, uh, endo motors. Uh, we worked on this for a really long time. Um, maybe you'll recognize from the files here, this is going to be more um, in line with the ProTaper technique. That's the one we have for now. And then we have um, some endo for the GPCE programs coming up. Um, they can learn about it on AmplifyDental.com in, in, in the new year. 
Uh, we're still not doing our live patient extraction courses. We just have to follow the rules, unfortunately, for um, COVID. And when there's over 100 plus people involved with patients for our extraction courses, it's just something we're not able to do at this time. So we're doing some more classroom-based programs, and um, that's the next one coming up is the endo for the GP. Um, I mentioned this. They're 23 bucks a blister pack. That's pretty fair. So if you are using um, the actual Pro Taper brand, I mean, you can save a lot of money. These these files are good. Um, they're going to be very comparable to those, or um, even if you're using like an Edge Endo or another brand. Uh, uh, take a look at our um, our new uh, Golden Taper files, which is similar to the Pro Taper, and the uh, the K files and the gutta perch and the paper points that obviously match it. Um, this is a really great endo motor. I just wanted to mention it. We've had um, really, really great feedback on this. We tested it in um, great detail too in France with our partner uh, over at, uh, at WAM, the, the, the WAM key folks. And this is a really, really good motor. I've had great, great success with it. Um, there's a lot of information on the slide, but if you're looking for a new endo motor, uh, 30 day risk free trial, you can use the promotional code too. Um, really, really great product. You can learn more about it on our website, look at some videos, and uh, call us if you have any questions. But again, these are totally off topic, but as I mentioned, we have the fiber posts, pins, and and uh, the metal and the fiber posts. And the pricing on these is, is very, very fair. I mean, if you're using Parapost or 3M or Pentron or TMS Coltine, um, I, I think you'll you'll be very happy with the pricing on these products. So that's it. Uh, the promo code again is 15% off, save 15, and I will turn it back over to Lauren and Dr. Krasinski for the Q&A, and I appreciate everybody's time this evening. Well, Kurt, so we, since we got you on, there's a couple questions I think more directed to you. Um, first, if someone wants to learn how to use the physics forceps, do you guys have any training? I know you're not doing the live classes. Are there any, like, any training videos on the website, or what's the best way for them to get a little more education? Yeah, sure. Um, I know uh, Dr. Krasinski mentioned at the beginning, uh, you know, uh, we used to make a ton of YouTube videos um, on the physics forceps. I, if you go to our website at the top of the uh, the page, it says um, clinical videos or uh, uh, clinical photos. At the top, there's some there's a there's a button that says I think it says clinical videos, and that will actually take you right to our YouTube page. I mean, there's hundreds, if, if not even approaching a thousand now. I mean, there's a lot of videos on there. Um, a lot of them are done by Dr. Krasinski that goes over the technique in detail. It also comes with a good uh, training uh, instructional um, video on how to use the product. It's, um, you know, there's a little learning curve to it. It's, uh, you know, as explained, you just don't want to squeeze and, and, and go through the protocol. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, information out there on our, our page that I think is actually very good and informative. You know, for every uh, you know, the courses were always great too, but again, there's there's plenty of people that obviously have purchased the instruments without taking the program. It's not something you need to do. Um, just some doctors are more comfortable doing that. Um, so long story short is there's a ton of information out there. If um, if you contact us in the office too, we can even send you some links if, um, you know, if you're interested in it or if you can't find the videos, but there's a lot of stuff out there. Okay. And what about, um, do you guys only sell in the U.S.? Or we, we got a, a, a number of my fellow Canadians on this evening. So uh, do you have any uh, availability for, in Canada for either the, the Fixus Forceps or the Iodine Rinse? Yeah, you know, uh, we, yeah, so we, I mean, we ship to Canada pretty much every day. Um, you know, we ship multiple packages to Canada every day. So that, that's not a problem. Um, we, we do ship to Canada, I guess, to answer the question. It, there's not a... Um, uh, really like a good distribution center or anything in Canada that has our products. So we ship direct and um, uh, how do I say this? I guess we figure out a way that, you know, makes it pretty, I guess, affordable for the um, the recipient in Canada. I know it's a little bit of a hassle shipping from the USA, but we um, uh, we do ship to Canada and it usually seems to work out okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Tim, you ready for some questions? Absolutely. Okay, we got a ton here, and I, you know, I'll, I'll remind people what I said at the beginning is that we're not going to get to all of them. I, I've been going through them as they're coming in. I'm trying to combine a few together. Uh, Tim, if you can limit your answers to three words or less, then we can probably get to most. <laughs> but um, can't, can't you do can that. that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but let's get started here. So, um, socket infection. You know, how much infection is too much that you would decide to hold off on doing a graft? Great, great question. Very important question. So, 
when, when we take it, if we have active infection, a uh, purulence, I will not immediately place an implant, but I will graft, the, I will uh, curette the site, curette the site, curette the site, clean it out as best you can. I don't have a problem grafting a site like that, but I won't immediately place an implant. And you have to explain that to the patient. And I guess the best analogy is um, if you've ever had a hangnail, you could be miserable, you can't walk, it, it, it's just horrible. You, you go in the tub, you soak your foot, you clip the nail, five minutes later, you forgot that you even had a problem. Uh, and the body is an amazing thing. Once the source of the infection is gone, it, it normally heals very well. But, but I don't immediately place an implant in an infected site. Okay. What about um, any experience with the, the Versa burrs? Like I said, I think it, if I recall those ones are used for like sinus lifts and like that. Do you ever use something like those burrs for, um, for you know, for standing the bone? I, or? Um, the Versa burr is, is a great technique. Um, again, a learning curve, as Kurt was saying. Um, and I, I certainly would would encourage people to to investigate it. Uh, obviously, the courses just aren't around right now. Um, th there's a lot of different techniques that we use to to do sinus tenting. I just I don't happen to use the Versa Bird, but I've heard good things about it. Okay. Um, any change in the, the forceps that you would use, or your in your technique, if the patient had a shallow uh, buccal vestibule? Um, and not really. Um, you know, the, the working end of the instrument is the, the, uh, the beak or the shovel shaped edge. Um, the most important part with that is that you must have a purchase point. So if, if I don't have a purchase point, or if the instrument is sliding off, I'll take a, um, a surgical burr and flatten the root on the palate or a lingual aspect. Um, you don't need to ex you don't need to use the, the, the bumper guard all the time, which gives you a little bit more room. Um, and again, remember the, the, the bumper is simply uh, um, a fulcrum or a center of rotation. Okay. Um, is there ever an indication, like, like when, in the first case, to uh, release the periosteum if you wanted to get more primary closure? Um, I, again, I, I'm not, I don't care about primary closure. I'm more concerned about the, the, the bandwidth of attached gingiva on the facial aspect. To get primary closure, you have to, you have to pull um, the tissue from the facial to, to the lingual or palatal, to the palatal in that situation, uh, which means that the mucosa may, may follow uh, and end up on the facial aspect of your implant. You cannot have mucosa on the facial aspect of your implant um, for a long-term uh, long prognosis. Yeah, I was going to say you can, it's just not going to work. But, right. Um, <laughs> when, <laughs> when, when placing PGA sutures um, after a bone graft procedure, are you waiting for the sutures to resorb on their own, or do you remove them after like seven to I, 10 you days? You know, in, 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 in my practice, we, we do a lot of surgery, and I like to see my patients in, in about seven days, 10 days at the most. Um, I just want to see how they're doing. Um, you know, patients don't always follow our directions to a T. Um, and so I have a tendency to bring them back in a week to remove the sutures. Um, if you leave them in too long, um, I, and, and that, that, that's fine, um, although the patients can have some, uh, a little bit more uh, discomfort after about four days. So I'd like to see my patients in about a week. Okay. Um, here's kind of a couple questions I'm kind of going to mush together here. Uh, when and why would you use a traditional allograft instead of the plug? And why not use the osteogen plug for everything if you don't need a membrane and the soft tissue will not infiltrate? Great question. So, so the material, the, the literature is, is fairly clear with this. Um, I will use an allograft material, um, a cadaver bone, um, when there is a facial defect. And, and again, we're, we're limiting our, our discussion here, Lauren, to facial defects, right? When, when we have all four walls intact, when we have a facial plate, the osteogen plug is my go-to material. It's, it's inexpensive and it's easy to use and it, and it works. I've done tons of histology um, on it and it works great. But when the facial wall is, is missing, um, I will use an allograft material and a long lasting resorbable membrane to protect it. The membrane has to be placed passively. It has to extend at least two millimeters beyond the defect and it has to extend onto the palatal or lingual aspect. And, it, and we need it to stay there for at least six weeks for, for me to have predictability. Short of that, I don't know if it's, not, if it's going to work or not. And if I'm going to invest my time and the patient's money in the procedure, I wanna know that I can grow a facial plate of uh, a facial wall. 
what what Implodent or Osteogen or Golden Dent uh, has said in, in, in the literature is if the defect is four millimeters or less, um, then you can use the Osteogen material, but I would still put some type of membrane on top of it to, pr to protect it, again, when you have a facial defect. Okay. The, um, the second to last case you showed using a, a porcine collagen membrane, what was the name of that membrane? The, the um, color coat from uh, Golden Dent, their yeah, collagen okay. membrane. Speaking about membranes, typically they have like a smooth side and a rough side. Does it make a difference which one is touching the bone? Well, you know, you know our, 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 our um, animal products don't have a side, but the EpiGuide does, and you want, you want smooth towards the bone. Um, again, so that you get epithelium attaching into the roughened surface of the, of the other side. But, but um, that, that's really the only membrane I know that has a side to it. Okay. The, the plugs, is there a typical absorption time for them? Uh, I, you know, I will, you can actually uh, objectively look at it radiographically. Um, remember how, how a socket will heal. It heals from the apex towards the crest. So you'll get more mature bone at the apex than you will towards the crest. So I will bring the patients back, depending on the size of the defect, in three or four months and take a radiograph. And if I see good, um, Lauren, if I see good integration at the apical portion, I'll go ahead and place my implant because I know that I'm going to obliterate what's on the crestal aspect anyways in my making my, um, uh, my osteotomy site. And number two, I'm going to wait for the implant to integrate anyway, so the bone is going to con continue to turn over. But most importantly, remember what I said, our initial stability with our implant is in the apical two millimeters. And if we had integration at the apical two millimeters of our socket, we're going to get a, a great result at the end. Great yeah. question. I like that one. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was on the last case you presented, the composite covering. What, which, uh, what was the name of that one? Um, you know, I just use, um, when, I, when I have an access hole for a screw retained prosthesis, um, I will either use some, some Teflon tape or a little cotton pellet to cover the, the screw hole. And then I will use, uh, we can, you can use impression material squirted in there. You can use, um, uh, you know, some kind of, a, 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 any kind of temporary material um, to kind of plug it. The reason I do that and I tell the patients, I put a temporary material in there because if they have any problems, biting your tongue, biting your cheek, uh, food trapping, I wanna be able to easily access that hole. If I put a composite in there, then I have to grind it out. It, it takes more time um, to do that. So, you know, whatever transitional material you wanna use is, is fine. When we do the final restoration, I'll just use your, your typical composite material. Okay. Uh, again, a couple of questions I'm kind of combining here. Um, all about torque. Is there a minimum initial torque? Is there a, a minimum final torque value? And if you get a spinner, what's the, the typical protocol at that point? You know, that, that's another really, really important question that we, that we, that we have to take a lot of time and, and think about. Um, torque is important, but it's, it's, it's not that critical to me position of the implant is, is most important. I want the implant to be at the crest of the ridge, uh, well, depending on which system you use, or in an immediate extraction site, I wanna go about a millimeter into the socket, and that's to get a physiologic response. Um, the literature will say, if we're able to get at least 25 Newton centimeters of torque, we can do a one-stage procedure, meaning we can put a healing abutment, which is simply a taller screw that penetrates through the soft tissue, which eliminates the need to expose the implant in the future. The literature will say if we get to 35 Newton centimeters of torque, we can immediately load the, the implant. I'm not a big immediate load guy. We talked about this before, Lauren. Um, I don't like to immediately load my single units. Uh, I'll, I'll load my, my multiple units in an arch, but my single units, I, I don't. Uh, that's just me. Uh, I'm not judging. Um, but you need to get at least 35 Newton centimeters. Any torque less than 25 Newton centimeters, um, I will give an extra month of healing. So let's say we give three months on the lower jaw, four months on the upper jaw, and we get 20 Newton centimeters of torque. Every five Newton centimeters of torque less than 25, I'd give it an extra month. So I would give it four months on the lower jaw and five months on the upper jaw, up to six months. Um, if we have no torque, 
allow time for it to heal. Physiologically, the body will heal and, and that implant will integrate anyways. Okay. How about um, if you're doing an immediate implant for say a, a lower molar, are you typically going into the septum? Or are you choosing you know, the mesial distal uh, root? I mean, how do you kind of make that decision? Yeah, ma mandibular molars probably, um, you know, number one, it's not in the aesthetic zone, okay? And uh, number two, um, I, no, I don't go into the mesial or distal socket. I, I want the attendees to realize I'm thinking tooth first. So I want that implant to be in an ideal position. If I put it in the mesial root, I'm gonna have a distal extension. If I put it in the distal root, I'm gonna have a, a mesial a cantilever type of thing. So I wanted to place it in an ideal position. So if, if we can do it in the septum, that's great. So, you know, probably, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say 60, 70% of the time, I can do an immediate implant in the mandibular molar, Lauren. But in the maxillary molars, because we have three roots, I, I almost never place an immediate implant in a maxillary molar area, just because I can't get it in an ideal position. I don't want to put it in the palatal sure. root. I don't want to put it in the mesial facial or distal facial. I want it dead center. Okay. Now you talked a lot about using membranes. Are there particular, you know, are there any specific cases for an immediate implant where you wouldn't feel it necessary to use a membrane? Um, uh, yeah, certainly. Um, if you're obliterating the socket, um, the literature will say um, if you have a gap between the the outer surface of the implant and the outer surface of the available, let's say, facial plate of bone is two millimeters or less, you don't you don't even need to graft it. I do, okay, I, I just feel more comfortable with, with my protocol, uh, with the results I get. Um, and um, certainly if, if you're, you're taking a tooth out and we're placing an implant and the implant is just about the same size as the root, um, we, we don't necessarily need a membrane to protect it. You're using a membrane to protect the graft material from invagination of epithelium. Um, however, if you have a smoker, Lauren, uh, a smoker, you have to protect that you know, it's an open wound and smokers are gonna smoke. So I would put some type of covering. You could take the, the osteogen and, and cut like a manhole cover and place it right on top of the implant to kind of protect that site and then suture over the top of it. Um, so those are basically the indications. Okay. So if you're like putting an implant in to, to a position where the plug is, are you doing, are you just sticking it straight through the plug? Or are you doing kind yep. of any fancy, like, kind of like a little mini osteotomy or how well, are you handling that? No, with, with the osteogen, because of the consistency of material, you can thread right into it and it just pushes out uh, and fills the gap. Allograph material, because the, the crystals are various shapes, uh, sometimes you're, you're not able to thread the implant in and I'll go back with the burr, just very quickly go in and out to allow that implant to, to engage completely. Okay. Um, I've got a, got a number of questions here about that, about the natural the tooth and the, the distal uh, implant. Um, yeah, I knew that would, will yeah. The tooth, yeah, will the, will the tooth distal to the implant continue to migrate distally over time, or does the bulk of that migration occur within the first month or so after seeding the yeah, implant? Yeah, my, my experience is if it's going to happen, it's going to happen within the first couple, three months. Uh, and that's why, um, you know, the patients, they wouldn't even know that you put a temporary material in there. Very few would even know that you did it if you didn't tell them. But I always tell them, um, you know, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll bring them back uh, at their next cleaning and evaluate it. You know, putting a composite restoration is just takes a matter of minutes in an access hole. So, um, uh, but that's yeah, a that really, was the next question. Like, really important concept. If, if it's that, moved, what do you do? What do you do at that point if it's moved? I mean, are you just putting some composite in and you're not doing a whole new crown? Take the crown. You have to do a new crown. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah, you do. Yep. Yep. And as I said, that's what I said. Glidewell Lab will, 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 will cover the cost of that. It's your time, but they'll cover the cost of the, of the crown. It's not the patient's fault. You know, you have to explain things ahead of time. And there's no way to predict it. But, you know, when the literature says 50% of the time that happens, I mean, you're flipping a coin whether it's going to happen or not. So just be aware. I, but as general dentist, Lauren, we have a tendency, the patient comes back and says, you know, hey, doc, I got a food trap there. We feel that we did something wrong. Like, boy, I can't believe I left that open contact like that. We don't do that. We don't leave open contacts. Um, right. So I just wanted everybody to be aware. I know it had nothing to do with what we were talking about, but I want people to be very aware of that, um, of that risk. Now, is this is this like a 
it's just a vicious circle that you're in that you you remake the crown and now what's you know can't the tooth move distally again it won't. once it's once it it's just going back it's got its muscle memory so to speak it's just going back to a certain position it, it, I, i've never done it twice N never in my career um and i'm not going to say it happens 50 percent of the time it may happen 10 percent of the time but again i've explained it to the patient ahead of time <laughs> it's inconvenient for everybody involved but you know, it, 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 it is what we're supposed to do to, to make things functional again. But, but once you replace it, the tooth doesn't continue to migrate uh, backwards. In the case, I think you show where you place a sheet of osteogen material. Did you lap it over the ridge or would you place some type of epi guide over the crest? No, no, that was, I use that as my membrane. It, that's something uh, that is relatively new, the, the sheets. Uh, and so we've been doing a lot of research with it. And uh, so I, I'll use that as my membrane. Okay. Um, you talked about uh, smokers. Did, will you change your approach? Do you for sure treat smokers? Do you sometimes you know, change your, your protocol if someone's a smoker? Um, I, I don't. The only thing that, as I mentioned before, um, you must protect the implant and the graft from the heat, tar, and nicotine smoke that's generated by a smoker. So you, you want to try to get primary closure or protect it with um, you know, a collagen plug or an osteogen plug. So put something over the top of it. Don't leave that implant exposed or the graph exposed. Okay. What about, you know, you, you're trying to get more apical with, with your drill. I mean, how do you prevent bottoming out or, or hitting the drill, drill head on the adjacent teeth when you need to advance the drills uh, in an apical direction? We have uh, uh, drill extensions, extenders. Okay. That give you more room, yeah. Okay, I want to try to get as many as we can in the next few minutes. Uh, Great questions. The graph materials. Yeah. Yep. Um, in the first case, did you do any type of facial bone decortication? Um, no, you know, I, I did not. Um, and, and as I said, when we have good bleeding, red blood is good. But if you don't have bleeding, you have to create it. And so that's where I will do some decortication um, with, with a round burr. Okay. In the case that you show with the apical dehiscence, uh, do you have to denude the facial aspects of the facial bone before plumping it out with the grafting material under the membrane? Uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't infected. It was just the anatomy of that tooth. Um, that because remember that 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 cuspid had a little facial curvature right at the root, um, so that it wasn't an infected site. And remember, I said, you know, if you leave a little granulation uh, in your grafting, the body's an amazing thing. Uh, it, it, once the source of the infection is gone, the body has a tendency to heal pretty quickly. Okay. Um, is there, are there certain circumstances where you would use an osteogen strip? Um, I, you know, again, we're doing a literature on that, using it as uh, to create a facial wall um, uh, in some respects, or, or uh, you know, as you mentioned before, uh, when you have a, a facial defect using the, the uh, calcium appetite material, using the strip for, to create a facial wall and then putting a, a longer term membrane on top of that, um, we, we've gotten pretty good results with that also. Okay. If it's a, a relatively large defect, are there times where you would combine, say, the osteogen plug with, with allograft or, or bone or you know, something in, in a large defect? Um, yeah, I, I guess I haven't really done that. Um, I, I, I don't, don't see any, any big complication to that. Um, you know, allograft's expensive. The osteogen plug is relatively inexpensive. Uh, and insurance doesn't cover gar grafting um, as general dentists. So um, <clears throat> that, I guess that's a decision that you just have to make um, mm -hmm. clinically. How about you know that case you showed with the, the curved root tip? Um, where are you getting stability from? Since you know you obviously can't go two millimeters beyond the apex in, in those particular cases. Are you just in that situation? Uh, where it would have been if it was straight. With okay, you know, and, and oftentimes you know your stability maybe on the on the palatal wall of that socket. Um, you know, and a two dimensional radiograph is is rather deceptive. You know, that's really not the 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 contour of the available bone that you have to work with. But in that situation, it was the width of the implant. Okay. For the PGA suture, I mean, that stuff, if I recall, typically can resorb like, you know, it can last for like a month or so. So why, if you're going to be removing it, why not just use a different tech, you know, a different material or silk or 
anything? What what is it about the uh, PG that's that? A, you that's have? a great question because it handle it handles like silk, but it doesn't give me the inflammation that silk would. Uh, gut and chromic gut are, are are difficult for me me personally to to manage to to maintain. Uh, knots have a tendency to loosen. <laughs> In like anything, we get very very comfortable with with the materials we're we're using. I want consistency. I want to know when I'm doing a procedure, it's going to work the way I expect it to work. Okay. Well, we're at the bottom of the hour here. And as I had mentioned, I, you know, I tried to get to all of them. We have about half a dozen that we didn't get to, and I apologize about that. Um, but uh, I want to be respectful of Dr. Kaczynski's time, of, of Kurt's time, and of course, all, all of your time as well. Uh, Tim, anything you'd like to say before we uh, wrap it up for the evening? Well, you just have to, uh, have to have me back again, Lauren. And I, I wish everybody uh, a very <laughs> Very safe and and happy um, holiday season. Uh, strange year, but looking forward to um, to uh, the rewards, both personally and professionally, for all of us in 2021. Um, please be safe, um, be smart, and Lauren, I, I really always appreciate you. You're you're a brilliant guy, and um, and um, everything that that you do for all of us and for the profession. So thank you. Well. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And, and certainly thank you to Tim. You know, we, we do this on a regular basis and we love having you back and uh, talk with Kurt because uh, I, I would be thrilled to have you back for the next webinar. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we do these webinars fairly regularly. I think we've got one more with um, with another company. Most of you will be on that uh, invitation list uh, next Tuesday night. Uh, and then with Golden Dent, we, I think we'll probably have one scheduled in either January or February to do the next one. Um, as, a, as a quick reminder, uh, this webinar was recorded. It will be sent out usually within a couple of days to everyone. If you haven't got it by, say, Friday, shoot me an email. And I'll make sure that it, it gets out to you. Uh, for the CE, as long as you were here for the bulk of the webinar, you'll be sent the CE form. There's nothing you need to do on your end. Uh, it can take up to a week or two to get those out, so, so please be patient. Um, thank you so much to, to Kurt and Golden Dent for their ongoing commitment to dental education to bringing in great speakers like Dr. Kaczynski to provide this content for everyone. Uh, I, I, I hope all of you learned at least one thing that you didn't know before you came in this evening, which is usually the case. Usually it's a lot more than that. Uh, but we, as I said, we will continue to do these webinars as long as people show up. Uh, please, if you want to take advantage of that special, um, it's, you know, they, they mean what they say and they say what they mean. And what I mean by that is that uh, Golden Dent's a great company. Uh, the specials are only for a short period of time. If you call them up on Friday and say, hey, I was on the webinar, you know, they're, they're not going to give you the special. I think this is a great opportunity. Uh, they've got a great return policy. You're not stuck with anything. If for some reason it doesn't work for your practice, that's very rare. Um, almost a lot of the clients that we work with uh, rave about the products. So uh, we were thrilled to have all of you on this evening. We know your time is valuable. Uh, safe and, and happy holidays to all of you, and we look forward to seeing you all on the next webinar. Good night, everyone. Good night.